Hey y'all, it's Jess. Welcome back to Roots and Refuge Farm. Today is garden tour day. I don't know exactly what week you would call this. I believe it's the seventh garden tour that I've done this year. However, I missed a week, so a lot has changed since the last time we took an official walk through the garden. And actually, we are on the brink of a lot more changing because it's now past the middle of July and it is now the time of year that I'm gonna be thinking about what's coming out to put in the fall garden. Fall gardening is kind of a strange thing because in the spring, all the big box stores, all the feed stores, garden centers, home improvement stores, they are pushing gardening. They've got all the products out by the front, plants lining by the front door, everywhere you go. Uh, there are reminders to say, hey, it's time to plant your garden. But as you're moving into fall, into August, into September, you're not seeing that stuff in any of the stores. You're seeing holiday stuff and college football stuff and back to school stuff. Basically, you're seeing the products that are gonna make those stores the most revenue and fall gardening just isn't it. But don't let that fool you into thinking that it's not a great time to grow a lot more food. I actually have a pretty in-depth video about planting a fall garden, which I will link down below and up here so you guys can check that out. Um, I won't repeat all of that stuff because it tells you all about kind of what to plant, when to plant, how to make a plan. But I did want you to know that right now, once we pass the middle of July, my mind kind of goes to that place. I'm thinking about what I'm doing with the second half of my growing season. Because we put the garden in at the very end of May, pretty much, I mean, a few cold weather things before then. But most of this went in at the end of May, so most of this garden has been planted for about three and a half months. And as you'll see as we walk through, a lot of it has already peaked. Um, it's kind of petering off. And so a lot of those things are gonna come out and I'm gonna plant again. And I have another three and a half months in my growing season to get a lot of harvest and another big, beautiful garden before it gets too cold to grow it. Now when I talk about things coming out and planting for fall, I don't have a real nailed down plan of what I'm going to plant where for fall, but basically what I'm doing now and over the course of the next week is I'm going to be making all of this space to be able to put the fall stuff in. The fall stuff will be things like brassicas, kales, cabbages, broccolis, cauliflowers. Um, those things I will start from seed inside here pretty soon, about now. The reason I start them inside instead of the greenhouse is because it's really, really hot in the greenhouse, like 120 degrees, nothing could germinate in there. But once the seedlings are established inside, I can move them outside. The other things I'll plant lots of are root vegetables. I have a video talking about growing root vegetables. I'll link that below as well for those of you who are gonna be researching your fall garden. Um, and the root vegetables are gonna go in all of these spaces. And then uh, lettuces, I'll do some more baby greens and head lettuces. And I'll actually plant a second planting of a lot of the things that are kind of folding to the heat right now or to pest pressure, things like squashes and cucumbers and green beans. All of those things will do a whole other wave of those. So actually the garden will be as full as it is right now in the end of September and into October, except for with different stuff. So right here on the inside of this bed, I'll leave this zinnia, this big cactus, Redmond zinnia. That's one plant that has all those blooms on it. It's been absolutely beautiful. Um, and that coleus, I'll leave that there, it's really pretty. The rest of this is all coming out. I've been saving seeds from the Tanya's Pink Pod, but this whole space will be reset for fall. Actually tearing it out will probably give more nutrients and resources to these Kajari melons and it'll help them fill out that space. Now the beans here that are covering this, the purple potted beans, these will all come out here pretty soon as well. And actually, that will probably be peas again. That was peas in the spring. I'll probably put peas up there again. Now all of my trellises that are currently planted with either beans or tomatoes, I'm planning on replanting all of them. Last year I did not. I just did a couple little sections with like green beans and I wasn't expecting them to do as well as they did. But they were fantastic and I wish that I had put more in so that in September and October I could be harvesting uh, bushels of green beans again, like in the spring. Also, um, 
I just love the garden being full and lush and beautiful and having the cattle panels covered is a big part of that. So definitely going to replant all of the trellises with peas and green beans. That's going to be a lot of green beans, a whole lot. Actually, I'll probably can most green beans in the fall. I've, I've already had a lot of green beans so far, but in my mind, um, I, have, I haven't actually done any canning. I've put some in the freezer and some different things like that, and we've been eating a lot fresh, but I've been preparing for fall being like my largest green bean season. Gary, please stop. Stop it. I need to grab one of my baskets really quick brought all my baskets out <laughs> and actually I'll go ahead and throw on my rue apron all right okay now I'm ready you may notice my tomato rose behind me they're looking kind of sickly we'll get to that in a minute so one thing that will happen that will be kind of interesting like I said as I pull out the stuff that's done it really does lend some benefit to the things that are staying. Like all of these pepper plants are staying and these eggplants, which the eggplants look pretty pitiful, but um, I'm gonna leave them. And these things will really just explode when they have no competition in the beds with them. And then by the time like these beans or peas start growing back up to cover this again, these pepper plants will really be at the point of peaking. The sun just came out with a fury, so uh, we'll get where we're not directly in front of it here in just a second. So I get asked a lot if I have a log or markers that people can't see or if I just have a ridiculous memory when it comes to the varieties in the garden. Most of these things are marked. And for the peppers, I have to check because I haven't been harvesting anything off of these. And whenever they're all green, I can't tell them apart. Now, as they start to change colors to what they're supposed to be, I can probably guess because I can remember what I've planted. But I've got these same markers that I used to like mark my seedlings when I started the seeds. And they're down in the ground right by the base of the plant. And most of them are covered up by hay, so I kind of have to unearth them in order to see. Now with the tomatoes, 90% of what I say to you about the tomatoes when I mention varieties, that actually is from memory and just from being able to recognize the fruit. I was not able to do that before the fruit was set. I had to check the variety um, at that point. But at this point of the season, after having checked the variety so many times and now that they have fruit on them, I can tell you most of those from memory. I don't keep a lot of a gardening journal, but I have a YouTube channel, I have garden tours. So if ever I can't remember something, I've got an incredibly detailed log here where I share it with you that I can go back and reference. I do though honestly have just like a silly capacity for remembering the garden. I joke about it because I can tell you what was planted where in this garden three years ago, what varieties, but I can't remember why I went into the grocery store. So, you know, maybe it was just a little misappropriation of memory, but uh, that is just how it is. So here I have a golden Mar Marconi. These are not ripe yet, but I'm really excited to try those. I loved the Marconi red last year. Here is the Criolla de Cochina. And it doesn't have just a ton of fruit set on it, but I see a lot more flowers. I was actually expecting this one to be smaller. I didn't realize it was as big as it is, but that's a seasoning pepper. Here I've got a couple of Ichabon eggplants that I've just harvested off of this plant. I've gotten a handful of eggplants this year. Not a lot, but more than last year. Uh, here I've got the Hascaria hot pepper. I'm putting all of the hot peppers that I picked today into the apron around my waist instead of in the baskets because I didn't want to risk going in and setting my basket down and my kids eating any of these. All the hot peppers that I pick, and this is typically what I do, we don't eat a lot of hot peppers. Um, aside from like jalapenos and serranos, it's about as hot as we go and I'll cook with those. Um, I'm going to try these to see just how hot they are to decide if I can put them in like sauces. If these are really hot peppers, which I, for some of you are probably like really hot, like I'm referring to like habanero heat and up. I don't even grow super hot. So I don't grow like ghost peppers and any of that stuff because my kids are always in my garden and they just eat stuff freely. And they know not to eat peppers, but I just didn't want to ever have anything in here that could hurt them. But what I do with hot, hotter peppers 
is I either use them in jellies, like with fruit, like we'll do like peach habanero jelly or strawberry uh, pepper jelly. And that's really good served over like cream cheese or on a turkey sandwich. It's really good on a turkey sandwich, also with cream cheese. Um, but what I'll do is I'll keep all of these separate and decide if I'm going to make anything like that with them. And if I don't have anything like that that I want to make, I just put these all in the dehydrator. And then we use them once they're dehydrated to make hot sauces, which almost entirely get used by guests and given as gifts because none of us really like super hot stuff. Now this plant here is really getting loaded down. This is a lemon, lemon drop pepper and it has a lot of peppers on it. All the rest of these pepper plants have fruit on them, but a lot of them are still very immature. So I think it'll probably be another week or two before we really start harvesting a lot. Goodness. So the hottest pepper that I plant typically is habaneros for this peach habanero jam that I really like. This year, I also planted a new variety called habanada is available through Baker Creek and I saw these were ripe and I thought hey I bet that's a habanada and I didn't see a tag and so I bit it it's not a habanada I am such a wimp when it comes to hot peppers it hurts <laughs> Just a habanero, literally like my mouth is on fire. Such a wimp. Okay, so here's one more that I wanna try. No idea how hot this pepper is. I don't think it's supposed to be very hot, but my mouth's already on fire, so you know, in for a penny, in for a pound, right? This is the Sugar Rush Peach, and it's got a lot of blossoms on it and only had a few fruits, but it's middle of July, and actually, in the gardens that I've done in the past, like peppers really, really take off here when it gets really hot, which is like end of July and August and into September. So we're actually just coming into like really pepper season. This pepper, the Sugar Rush, the Sugar Rush Peach, is one that I've tried to grow. I tried to grow it last year and with I lost a lot of my pepper plants putting them in too early. And then I went to the Baker Creek Expo in California in September and this one had like awards on it. And so I was super excited about it. Now, the description says that the seeds are spicy, but this, the meat is sweet. So I'm gonna bite this pepper and I hope that it doesn't kill me. Okay. <laughs> it's a hot pepper, <laughs> but it's a really good hot pepper. Oh goodness, I'm gonna have hiccups now. It's gonna, it's a. <laughs> I gotta guess something on the <laughs> Guys, I will tell you how to grow tomatoes every year, forever, but I will never be the channel that tells you how to grow hot peppers or what to do with them. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> okay, so the Sugar Rush Peach. That actually was a really, really, really good pepper. Super good flavor, really fruity. Probably a similar heat of a good hot Serrano. Like, honestly, like it immediately gave me hiccups, but like three minutes later, um, I can still feel it, but it's not like burning my mouth or anything. That would be really great in jams. I think those would be fantastic pickled uh, to use like on nachos or, um, you know, anywhere where you would want to put pickled pepper rings on. That's probably what I will do with a lot of those. Um, there's also a recipe I've mentioned before that I use with jalapenos called cowboy candy. And I'm thinking that what I'm gonna do with like the total mix is maybe do like a mixed pepper cowboy candy. And those would be so good in it because they have that really good kind of tropically pepper flavor that habaneros have, but they burn your face off. Don't laugh at me. I just can't do really hot food. <laughs> now here are the okras and I'm actually not picking these right now because I have a whole lot in the house and these are all on the small side. We just did like a really thorough harvest a couple of nights ago. Now these will need to be picked by like this evening or tomorrow or they'll get too big. They grow really fast. This is old Alabama red okra. Daniel actually planted these when he was here from Alabama once. 
The season of abundant okra is upon us and I am not complaining. Over here, these chrysanthemum melons are coming along nicely. I don't have any that are ready to harvest yet and I don't think they get super huge. Now this is the one that Baker Creek listed in their description that it has the faint flavor of Greek yogurt and that is literally the only reason why I grew this fruit. But it's not even that I love Greek yogurt. I just needed to know what a melon that tasted like Greek yogurt tasted like. So all this will be torn out and replanted soon so we'll have a little season of that being bare. And then we've got some things coming up here from whenever Benjamin and I sowed those willy-nilly seeds. Um, and so this I will end up planting in all of the spaces. A lot of this is peppers and like I said they're just about to take off. Here I've got some mini red bell peppers. Aren't these super cute? That's the same plant right there, mini red bells. Now the Kajari melons are looking awesome. None of these are ripe yet. Of course they turn orange when they ripen. I showed in a vlog hanging these up with these bags, but I will link the bags that I use down below. And I use those plastic bags because I just have them and um, I've got enough that are, they're gonna be lasting me for a long time. But you can use pantyhose, you can use cut up loofah, sponge things, um, just pieces of fabric. You can give vertical growing melon support. Um, I like those bags pretty well and I, I just have hundreds of them so that's why I'll be using them for years. Oh let's talk about the tomatoes. As you can see things are looking pretty rough. The tomato rows behind me that run perpendicular to the rest of the garden they are not on the brink of death. Um, they were planted later and the ones in these two long beds of tomatoes most of these plants are very sick um, I've done the peroxide spray a few times and I think that it helped because the, the tomatoes really started showing signs of sickness much earlier than in years past because we've had a ton of rain and that is really hard on them as far as staying healthy. So I think the peroxide spray bought me more time um, but it's really coming into the time that these two rows of tomatoes need to come out. Uh, so I am harvesting everything off of them today and over the next couple of days I'm just keeping an eye on them. Some of the plants I may pull out sooner than others but they still have a lot of green fruit on them. With the green fruit, I mentioned this the other day and uh, you know some people had mentioned you can take the plants in and hang them upside down but I've got like 120 plants so I don't really have anywhere in my house to do that. Uh, some people will take the green fruit and wrap it up inside to just let it ripen over the course of a few months. That's also an option. What I will probably do is just process the green fruit, make um, some relishes or chow chow or something like that. Uh, I'll find some green tomato recipe uh, and, and put this stuff up. I still have a lot of tomatoes to harvest today though, even off these sickly plants. Most of these varieties I covered the other day when I did my big tomato harvest video. So I won't go through and just repeat all of that. If you want to hear all about these different varieties of tomatoes, it'll be there. If there's anything that I didn't cover in that video, however, I will share it with you here. Wow, look at that Get Stuff tomato. Now I did actually love this tomato and I probably won't grow it next year, but if I did, it would simply be for how pretty it is. Isn't that absolutely gorgeous? So the other day I harvested four heart-shaped tomatoes in one day. And it looks like today might be another day that the garden wants to tell me that it loves me. This is another really large Italian heirloom. I've got two of these plants. They've produced a ton. Super meaty tomatoes, really low seeds. Definitely will be on my mess grow list from now on. I actually got the seeds for this at a place called Fruition Seeds. And they, they specialize in seeds for like northern climates. So uh, I don't even remember how I found them, but I really liked a lot of what they offered and so I bought these a couple years ago and didn't get them to germinate just because I started them a lot later and probably neglected them uh, and then grew them this year and definitely on my must grow list some of these have been close to two pounds a lot of 20 ounce big meaty tomatoes have come off of these plants there's a really big Cherokee rose that I pulled off the vine and uh, dropped and busted so might as well go for it so this is really very ripe, probably overripe, but this is a really good tomato. Holy smokes, that is so like 
full of juice. <laughs> Man, that stinks. If that happened, I dropped it and it landed on the edge of the bed. So that one was totally my fault. I've been blaming it all on my chickens. Honestly, can't believe how many tomatoes I'm still getting with the plants being as sickly as they are. Um, I mean, it's a lot. This is another 20 pounds of tomatoes and I still have a lot to pick. Sometimes I come across a tomato and know that it is just meant to be a tomato sandwich. And that is the case with this one. Dr. Witchy's my favorite one. I've been doing something new and I haven't told you all about it yet. So I showed you how I love to make a tomato sandwich and I love taking just like a big fat honking slice of tomato and putting it on there. Still love that method. And if I'm just making a tomato sandwich for myself, it doesn't make sense to cut more than one tomato to make it, so that's how I'll do it. However, I have now raised two tomato sandwich loving babies. Uh, four of mine will turn their nose up at tomato sandwiches, but two of them, as soon as they see me get the bread down and get the tomatoes and the toaster out, they're like, can I have a tomato sandwich? And I'm like, yes, you can. Because whenever I am making three tomato sandwiches, one tomato's not gonna cut it, so I'm gonna have to cut two tomatoes. And what I like to do is take like a really good yellow, like a Kellogg's breakfast or Dr. Witchie's, like a good, sweet yellow tomato and something dark and like smoky, like a Paul Robeson. And I like to cut both of them very thinly and stack them. And so using two different kind of tomatoes on one sandwich. And of course, everything else is the same. Toasted bread, mayo, good flaky salt. It's so good. The tomato sandwich is like, got a fresh new twist. Try it, let me know what you think. Look at this weird gold medal that is ripening. That was a fused tomato gone gone terribly wrong. Now, this is why it's important to grow things that are developed for and in your region. If you can find locally developed varieties, like it's worth making extra space. Now, this plant, you see this one healthy plant sandwiched in between these dying and diseased plants. I mean, there's just disease all around, but this plant is very unfazed by the disease. Still got a lot of fruit. It has a little bit of spot there in the middle where there's not very much uh, airflow, but for the most part you can tell that this is a standout as far as health goes in this little area. That is the Arkansas Traveler tomato. Um, it was developed in Arkansas and therefore it is used to the heat, the humidity, uh, the wet weather, that is so typical of our summers. If you're really going after production, um, like with this Arkansas Traveler, this tomato itself is like just meh to me. Um, it's just a red tomato. It's not like I bite into it. Like that Cherokee Rose tomato that I just ate a lot of, um, I mean, I'm biting that and eating that and being like, oh my goodness. Seriously, so good, so flavorful. So juicy, it's interesting. It's got that matte skin, it was bred off a of mutation, came from Wild Boar Farms. The plant, kind of sickly. Will I get to get tomatoes off of it all year? No, I won't. But to me, it's worth it for the window that I do get them to get something extraordinary that there's no other way, like if I didn't grow that plant, I would likely never in my life eat that fruit. Arkansas Traveler, I could go get this fruit at the farmer's market because everybody grows it here. Um, I could probably actually get it in like a grocery store like Whole Foods. They'll end up selling Arkansas Traveler tomatoes. This is just a really popular heirloom in this area. But when you look at how healthy this plant is, you know why it's really popular in this area. Because it was obviously developed to stand up to our conditions. So it's kind of like a you weigh it out. And so for me, like looking at this, my mind thinks, you know, it would probably wor be worth it to plant five or 10 of these next year um, and still grow my interesting varieties, still grow all my beautiful stuff, but so that when all of those things fold in late July, I've got tomatoes through August uh, with this Arkansas Traveler. Um, that's probably what I'll end up doing. Because they still may be kind of average as far as homegrown tomatoes go when you're comparing them to some of these really unique large varieties. But, I mean, they're still gonna be good. They still grew in my yard. 
um, they weren't commercially produced, they weren't shipped, they weren't picked under ripe. Um, and so whenever you weigh it out like that, it's better to grow some things like this than, than being a stickler to only grow uh, interesting varieties. Okay, I need another basket. Actually, I think that we are going to go ahead and walk through the rest of the garden and then I'll finish harvesting the other two tomato rows when we're done because I'm afraid it's gonna get too bright for you guys to really get to see what I'm showing you. So right here, the holy basil's filling out, smelling wonderful. I've actually got a few places where I've planted it in the garden this year. This particular plant is doing the best. This started as one tiny little start. Now down here, I've got a couple of chili plants called chili chilaca, and these are gonna ripen to a nice dark purple. Open space. One of the borages that's still holding on, a lot of those have died, and then of course our ground cherries, which are going crazy. And at this point, that's all that's really in this bed. Um, are the ground cherries and some marigolds and a few chili plants. Now, this is the row with the sickly tomatoes. And our plan for this row is that as soon as these tomato plants really are done, like they're not gonna give us any more fruit, we'll pick everything that's green, we'll tear them out, and we're actually gonna take these cattle panels down. Since this bed is almost entirely empty, um, we, are going to be planting a lot of the fall stuff in here and we're going to build a little hoop cover over it. Just something really basic with some frost fabric. Um, and, and in that, we'll see if we can carry the ground cherries past the frost, but all the fall stuff will be in here and that'll just give it a little extra coverage from the frost. Most brassicas and the stuff that I'll be planting, root vegetables, they're fine below freezing, uh, quite a bit below freezing actually. And so they can grow a good deal into the winter here at least without dying. Uh, but with a frost cover, a lot of things I can get all the way through the winter. It doesn't get that cold here though. So for those of you that are like up in the Northern areas, it's not gonna work for you. My grow bag peppers are all doing really well. Oh, I missed a tomato. See, but down here on this end, this is just itching for a refresh. So this is all gonna be replanted and full. Uh, I never did get this bed filled out for spring. Here in these beds, I've got some volunteer zinnias that are doing really nicely. Uh, borage that also volunteered. All of this will be cut out. And I probably won't replant much for fall right here because these zinnias are so huge, but I may go ahead and plant some more of them, maybe in a different color. The okra will do well. That's gonna get really huge. Those will grow almost all the way to fall. Check this out. So the Titan sunflowers are all open now. That one is a little over 12 foot tall. This one is about nine foot tall. Uh, but look at this. The cucamelons, I had one cucamelon plant in this bed and they're growing up the sunflowers. Isn't that funny? Little cucamelons. My other cucamelons didn't really take off. I'm still hoping that they will. But this one single plant is growing all up over here on top of another cucumber. And it's just enough for snacking. I haven't been making any cute little pickles this year, but I still do have some cucamelons. So the cucumber plants, they're still putting off little fruits and flowers. Um, some of them are doing better than others. The ones that are struggling, I'll pull and replant. Um, and then some, I'll just let them go ahead and finish their course. We have started harvesting Benny Kadima melons. They're super, super sweet, really good, lots of seeds. Um, so the jury's still out on whether we're gonna have to have those in the garden next year. And we should be harvesting our first uh, Caho melon here very soon. This week, I would I would guess by the looks of it. Now the banana trees look awesome. The Tabasco peppers are coming along underneath them. Now, these square beds had a lot of squash planted in them, and of course, I lost most of my squash in the battle of the squash bugs. And a lot of them had beans, bush beans, which are done producing. <laughs> I didn't hear you back there. <laughs> Coffee. Thank I think, you. I think subconsciously you're missing me. Why do you say that? Because your body keeps calling me. Oh my god, I'm, I keep calling you on my phone? Yeah. Oh, you're not being weird by saying that? You actually mean I'm butt dialing you? <laughs> I'm like, I pick it up, I'm like, hello? And you're like, these peppers are looking great. <laughs> like, okay. and I literally call right back, the Kajari melons are looking super. And I'm like, she just misses me. She just doesn't know it yet. 
All right, coffee break has been had. Now back to the tour. Uh, I think you're gonna be able to get an idea for the heat and humidity as my hair just continues to grow out here. It is so warm. Um, I'm sure drinking hot coffee didn't help that, but it's, it's very warm, very humid. Enough that I think I've lost my little shadow. Um, he's gonna chill in the shade probably for the rest of the day. Here on the side of these two beds, Again, I'm probably gonna replant those cucumbers. Um, more peppers coming up here looking good. More ground cherries. These are the Aunt Molly's variety. They're really, really good. A couple more things coming up from seed here. Oh goodness. Here comes trouble. They heard me start talking again and have to come join me. Here's some more space where things have already died from heat and bugs. And as I was saying, the square beds, they, almost entirely need to be replanted. One thing I'm keeping in mind right now as I'm just beginning to make a mental plan for fall is not just where I'm going to put in brassicas and lettuces and roots, but also where my garlic is gonna go because I'll be planting that like further into the fall, late October. That's about whenever we put it in here. And I want to plant a lot more garlic than I did last year. Last year I just did one square bed. And this year, I'm thinking I'm gonna do a pretty significant section, possibly in one of the long beds. Uh, I haven't quite decided where that's gonna go, but it doesn't have to have any sort of cover over winter. And so it's not gonna be in the place where there's any of the hoop houses. And I probably won't do it in a square bed again. I think that I'll probably do it in one of the long ones. Don't know yet, but that's something to keep in mind when you're planting your fall garden. The cherry tomatoes are all still very healthy and very productive. They'll actually last quite a bit longer than the slicers in my experience. That's actually all just weeds that have come up in the garlic bed. Of course the lemon balm and mint is just berserk at this point. And the teddy bear sunflowers are starting to uh, kind of end their course. Here's more okra and these are still going to get a lot larger. And the flowers are just so beautiful. Okra blossoms are genuinely one of my favorite flowers. Of course, they're in that hibiscus family and you can really see that in the blooms. But I love how surprised people are when they grow okra for the first time because they just had no idea they had such beautiful flowers. The Armenian white cucumbers are just still doing amazing. Now, this did happen here. These melons and these cucumbers sort of went out and I ended up just letting them because there was nothing else here. And so I've got stuff growing all over this bed. So here I've got the Golden Jenny melon and that's what's getting all over in this bed. And these are a really small uh, webbed cantaloupe. Really, really good melon. They get super sweet. Uh, these plants are really loaded down. They haven't started growing high enough that I've needed to put supports. All of these lower ones will be fine. Normally I don't allow things to go all out in the walkways but it started this year and I thought it was kind of dreamy looking, which is probably really silly of me, but don't y'all think that's really pretty, the way that it's growing over and then spilling down? So I just left them. Um, with the mulch down, we actually haven't had to weed eat our rows, even though they, they do have a little bit of weeds. And so I just kind of let these things spill out because I thought it was pretty. Here, these are purple hole peas all in this area. Um, it's a hot mess. They're not producing yet, so it's all these things are kind of spilling together. We'll see what happens. And here, check out this majestic display. These are the python snake beans from Baker Creek. I've never grown these before. They were just actually introduced at Baker Creek this year. And I'm shooting this garden tour today. You actually won't see this for a couple of days because these take a really long time to edit. After I wrap up this garden tour, I'm going to shoot another video. I'm going to harvest these at three different sizes and I'm going to take them inside my house and cook them because I have no idea what to do with them. Uh, the seed packet actually said, use as you would use summer squash or green beans. And I thought, hmm, that's an interesting you know, thing to throw together there because I don't use summer squash the way that I use green beans. And um, I've had a few people tell me like at what stage to harvest them, but I've heard different things. So I've done a little bit of research and I'm just going to harvest these at three different stages. 
some of these these feel really hollow when they're this big so I have no idea um, if these are even gonna be edible they may not when they're this size they're just starting to hollow out um, and so I would think that this might still be and now when they're this size these really small ones they're still super soft and so I could see how this would be likened to like a summer squash but anyway I'm gonna after this is wrapped up the tour I'm gonna harvest the three different sizes they're very fascinating though I mean incredibly cool and from what I can tell very prolific because not only do I have multiple really large beans there are tons of small ones all over here and from what I understand these are originating from very hot climates and I, I see absolutely zero stress on these plants from our heat and humidity I mean just not a single spot they just look absolutely perfect tons of blossoms all over them as far as saying it's a very interesting thing to grow I can very confidently say that um, a pretty easy thing to grow I can say that as well they they're wild they're going everywhere and just grabbing hold of everything we'll see if they end up just taking over this entire area of the garden uh, however I don't know how valuable they are as far as food production goes because I haven't I haven't eaten any of them. We'll figure that out here in a little while. Here we have more big okra plants. They're finally taller than me. And so at this point, we are getting a lot of okra. We've just been eating it fresh, uh, broiling it, frying it, or just eating it raw. But it's getting to the point that I'm gonna have to start pickling some of it or it's just, uh, it's gonna go to waste because it's really starting to overtake us. Got more tomatoes. My medium-sized tomatoes are down here, so I'll have to pick these with the rest. And then all of these pepper plants, these are jalapenos. Up until this point, I've just been harvesting jalapenos as I need them for cooking and salsa. Um, I, haven't, I haven't done anything to preserve any yet because I haven't had that many. Now my amaranth broke, this one and the other. Um, and I've just left them laying down in the aisles because they still seem like relatively healthy. I've not grown amaranth before. I haven't harvested the grains yet but these are looking like they're just starting to dry up well, down here i have some more tomatoes you know i need to do some work down here tying stuff up but i've still got some really large tomatoes down here um and here i've got beans a lot of this blank space these are going to be fall crops but i've got some beans coming up here some sunflowers that i'm pretty sure Benjamin planted these when we were doing the willy-nilly sowing because there's about eight all close together but I just left them because they're growing in a cluster and they seem to be doing all right they just won't get super big here are my cucamelons and I still have hope that these are really just going to take off and cover this trellis we still got enough time it's just going to be a lot later than it was last year and this amaranth is huge this is one plant it started as one start that was just this big a few months ago. Is that not absolutely wild? The Israel melons here are getting really large. I've got a few down here on the ground. If you can see those down there on the ground. They're looking really good. We should be harvesting these pretty soon. And this is a melon called, uh, I believe it's Maduraz. I might have that wrong. And it's not really said anything yet. However, I believe that's an Indian melon and therefore it probably will have the most growth when it gets really, really hot. There's a little charred plant or a couple of charred plants that came up there. Cucumbers, still setting fruit, still putting off a lot of flowers. So I'm just gonna leave these here and hopefully continue to get some harvests of these little pickling cucumbers. Here's that little hot mess area from the other side of snake beans and melons and purple hole peas. Uh, it's kind of overtaking some of these peppers. Not really a display of my finest gardening skills, but you know, oh well. Now this beautiful plant growing up this trellis is Malabar spinach, and I've got it on both sides. It is a heat lover, and it is a vining plant that you eat the leaves of like spinach, and I'm really excited to have this coming in right now. It's gonna do great into August. It loves really hot weather, and uh, it's nice to have something to harvest for salads when it's so it's you know far too hot for other varieties the texture of this is a little weird um, if you've ever eaten purslane purslane is is very it's got a lot of like mucilage to it it's it's a little slimy inside and malabar spinaches as well 
Hey, little photo bomber. I didn't know you were behind me. How are they still eating that? I just gave them a new cucumber that I found. No, they eat those cucumbers fast. Now, here's where my Rampicante squash was. Now, the Rampicante squash is said to be squash bug and vine borer tolerant. Maybe that's the case. Um, it did produce longer than my other ones, but it d still did end up dying uh, because of squash bugs and vine borers. That's okay. I really don't expect much different. I liked the squash. It was the real long one. Everybody said it kind of looked like a swan's neck. Uh, it's very mild in flavor. You know, sometimes you'll eat summer squashes that are just really nutty and flavorful. It's not. It was actually... I don't want to use the word bland because bland has a really negative connotation. I didn't think it was bad that it was so mild because the way I'll cook summer squash is to just dice it and saute some garlic and onions and coconut oil and then saute the squash, put a little bit of salt on it and some pepper. And it actually carried those flavors fantastically. It was really, really good like that. All on its own you would probably call it bland, but with the way that you could cook it, I think it's a really good option. The other thing is, one single squash fed my entire family with leftovers. One single squash. Uh, so that's one that I will definitely grow again. The other benefit, of course, is that it is a vining summer squash. Usually, when you're growing summer squashes, there are bush varieties, and so to have a vining summer squash, since I do love vertical gardening and the trellises, it's just a really good option to have growing in a raised bed garden. I've got more green beans to harvest. These are loaded down, so we'll probably harvest these today. And down here on the end, I have a really interesting cucumber variety called Yamato Long. Now, if you're looking at a seed pack and cucumbers, you'll see the word burpless, and that's talking about those little pokey, prickly things on the sides, um, and burpless, doesn't have those, they're smooth. This is not a burpless variety, it's definitely very prickly. Uh, you can just rub those off, but just harvesting cucumbers that have those spines, um, it's not, not fun. So these are a really thin, long cucumber. And they're just really good. Kind of an unusual shape, being so long and thin, but I think it's kind of forgiving as far as um, making pickles and stuff and having pickling cucumbers because you get these nice little coins from it whereas a lot of pickling cucumbers if you're a little late on picking them they get so big around that they're kind of difficult to make pickles out of but i i like these they have enough juice in them to make them worth juicing this is an asian variety i don't know the origin of these seeds exactly but yamato it's a Japanese name and so I'm assuming that this is a Japanese cucumber and so with that said a lot of times when you're growing Asian varieties if you live in a hot climate you're going to end up with healthier plants in the heat whereas if you grow more northern varieties that were developed further north they're gonna start struggling when it gets hot like right now these cucumbers like, there's not any crunchiness on the leaves overall they look really good and I'm really happy with this variety. This is one that I, I believe I will continue to grow. Oh look, my little pot of purslane has started to bloom. That's pretty. I still have a few really good months to grow a lot in my garden. And for some people, when the first round that you plant starts to die or needs to be pulled out, they think, oh, I'm done, my garden's over. But I wanna encourage you guys to really embrace the idea of planting again. Even if you live in a more northern area and you don't have as much time as me, look into planting some of these brassicas. You might need to do it sooner rather than later. There are quite a few things that will do well even into some cold weather. Now here, our ground doesn't really ever freeze super hard. If it gets in the single digits where it's actually cold enough to really freeze the ground, it's, it's only ever for a couple of days. So I do have the ability to grow some things with cover throughout the year. And I know that's not the case in areas of the country where it gets, you know, into the negative 30s and 40s. You're only gonna be able to grow indoors with supplemental heat. However, you could grow beyond those first frost dates. You could still get more 
out of your garden. And so don't just don't give up just because it's not being marketed to you is what I'm saying. Really think about what you can put in. Do second plantings of things that don't take very long and uh, and definitely look into those fall crops. Thank you guys for hanging out with me today. I bless you. Until next time. <laughs>